A senior United Nations official has urged both Israel and the Palestinians to carry out their own investigation into the recent conflict. Flavia Pansieri called on both sides to take steps to ensure accountability for violations of international human rights and humanitarian law that were committed. The plea came just hours before Israeli troops killed two Palestinians, who they suspected of the killing of the three teenagers in the West Bank earlier this summer. Sadia Chowdhury brings us this story in human rights in one of the world's most controversial countries. This is what human rights looks like in the occupied West Bank. Ordinary people rush to pick up bodies as an emergency vehicle cools down. There's another body lying on the floor, but Palestinians in the West Bank tread carefully in their rescue mission because Israeli soldiers are still nearby. Early this morning, the army made its way into the West Bank city of Al Khalil and killed two Palestinian men. Marwan Kawasme and Amar Abu Aisha had been on Israel's wanted list since June, suspected of killing three Israeli teenagers, but neither men had ever faced trial. Local residents said troops had surrounded a house in the city before a firefight ensued. The Israeli army later confirmed it had killed one of the suspects and that a second was, quote, assumed dead. Perhaps anywhere else in the world, this kind of killing of suspects would raise an alarm or call for an immediate inquiry. But here in the West Bank, Palestinians have become somewhat accustomed to a human rights system that shoots first and inquires later. Human rights groups are yet to comment on the case, but this morning, Toby Cadman, an international lawyer, told us he hopes there will be a swift and thorough investigation into what he said sounds like an extrajudicial killing. As calls come in for details to emerge over the deaths, Israel's human rights elsewhere take the spotlight. Yesterday, the country's highest court outlawed a detention centre where African migrants are held without trial. A judge ordered some 2,000 inmates to be released over the next three months. The ruling struck down a measure passed by Israel's parliament last December to indefinitely incarcerate migrants. Human rights groups had criticized the motion as an attempt to force migrants to leave. Most of the residents at the Holot detention center are from Sudan and Eritrea. Israeli leaders have denounced the migrants who they refer to as infiltrators. They say the migrants are harmful to Israel and had taken steps to stop their entry by fortifying a fence along the Egyptian border in 2012. The government has offered financial incentives to those agreeing to leave while detaining thousands of others. The Holot Detention Center was opened a year ago in the southern Negev desert. The decision to close it gives Israel three months to implement the ruling but orders an immediate liberalization of rules for Holot inmates. To discuss this, I'm joined in the studio by Alistair Sloan, who's a columnist for Al Jazeera English. And on the phone, we're joined by Dr. Nabil Shath, who is a foreign relations commissioner for Fatah. Welcome to you both. Alistair, you've just come back from uh, the West Bank and uh, Israel. I mean, uh, how tense is it there at the moment and how important are these human rights abuses? Um, it's very, very tense. Um, I, I spoke to, to lots and lots of people who felt that the recent conflict um, had generated an unusual amount of unity, which was also uh, quite encouraging. Um, but overall, there is a great deal of anger. There's a great feeling of injustice. Um, and that is kind of gelling people together, which is strong. But uh, overall, there's a, there's, a, there's a great deal of sadness as well. Now, Bill, Israel is a democracy, sure. That's its great claim. It, it's a, the one democracy in the region. And here we are finding out about human rights abuses. How do the two things stand together? Dr. Nabil, are you still with us? Hello, yes. Hi. Israel's is great claim is it's a democracy, the one democracy in the region, and yet we have these human rights abuses being reported. How can the two things stand together? Well, you know, we, we started democratically at the Palestinian Revolution, and when the Palestinian Authority was created, we started with elections in, in 1996 and then 2006, and then... Uh, we are really late in uh, uh, new elections because we have uh, separation between Gaza and the West Bank, and the unity arrangements uh, would have provided for elections uh, in the coming three months. Now, the, the, Gaza, the attack by the horrible attack by Israel on Gaza, I think, probably will delay the, uh, these elections at least until Gaza is 
in shape to uh, conduct uh, these general elections in Gaza and the West Bank. But we insist on our democracy, and we shall continue every uh, effort possible to, to have our unity built on uh, uh, democracy and c consulting the people on their choices. Alistair, just to return to that point, I mean, Israel's great claim is that it's a democracy, uh, the one democracy in the region, as I said, and that's held up by its supporters in the West. And its human rights record is abysmal. Um, I like to call it a plastic democracy. So um, it's got all the kind of trappings of a, a free society, but it has a, a couple of crucial elements missing. Uh, one of them uh, is the media. So you've got a lot of politicians who are moving over from TV stations like Channel 2, uh, into the political classes. Um, you've got uh, a media that in general doesn't criticise uh, the government um, and doesn't highlight human rights abuses. Um, the, the largest selling uh, Hebrew newspaper on the first day of Operation Protective Edge didn't have a single mention of civilian casualties. Um, all of the kind of excesses in the, the West Bank and Gaza which go on day in, day out, every night, raids, um, these aren't reported on. So it's very, very difficult for the Israeli people to have sight of the human rights abuses which are, which are really, really going on. And Dr Nabil, I mean, here we have people coming into the West Bank, the Israeli army coming in and carrying out summary executions. I mean, in any other country in the world, if a government did that, the West would be denouncing it from, uh, from right to left. But nothing is said about this. Do you feel this is hypocrisy? It's an utter hypocrisy. There is nothing but uh, uh, extrajudicial killing uh, that the Israelis have done since the moment they occupied uh, uh, our country. There, there is no uh, recourse to any sort of law. I mean, who, who gave them the, the, the permission to kill 2,200 civilians in Gaza? Who gave them the permission to injure, injure 12,000 people, most of them children and women? Uh, and they are in full sight of everything that goes on in Gaza. They have absolutely no excuse that this was uh, n not foreseen or this was an accident or uh, civilians. Actually, we, we have proof that they, they did not hit any school or any uh, building unless it was f full of civilians. So, I mean... This, uh, this mockery of justice has gone on in Israel from the very beginning of uh, its formation on our land. Uh, also, to return to that point, the West does keep quiet about this, doesn't it? There's really no discussion in the Western media, in the mainstream media, about Israel's human rights record. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of a taboo to talk about um, the power and influence that Israeli interests have in uh, Washington and in Brussels and in Westminster. Um, it's kind of framed as, as an anti-Semitic discourse. If you talk about the, the powerful lobbies, the huge amounts of donations which go into British politics uh, as well as in Washington. So it's very, very difficult to, to have an honest discussion without, without addressing those fundamental structural problems in the West which are creating a kind of perversion uh, of public opinion uh, because of the influence of all this, all this money. And Dr Nabil, Speaking from the West Bank, how do you feel about this Western silence about Israel's own human rights record? This silence has really gone on for a very long time. At the beginning, we used to be told, well, the West somehow uh, tarnished by its history of Holocaust and uh, racism uh, cannot uh, really uh, speak freely on matters that the, the Jewish Israeli state uh, uh, can do in violation of law. But, but this has really gone too far. And I think uh, in the West, I think there's a general uh, realization that, that this whole thing was really a mockery of justice. And, has, and, and it's, it's, it's very it, un, unfortunate that uh, uh, we, the Palestinians, had to pay for the crimes of the Germans in World War II. Uh, there was a Holocaust, but we did not commit it. It, it was Europeans that, that have done it. And if they had to pay a price for it, they shouldn't have paid the price from our own flesh and blood, as, uh, as it may happen. But I think there is more awareness, particularly after the last three attacks on Gaza. There is more awareness uh, about the need 
to really uh, uh, make the Israelis accountable to their violation of the uh, international human rights and international humanitarian law. Thank you. Alistair, I mean, Israel is a state founded by people freeing terrible oppression, racism, genocide. And yet here we have this report in our package about racism in Israel. Is that the only way you could describe it towards migrants? Well, I mean, is it, is it any surprise, really? I mean, the, the, the fundamentals of, of the state, although it was, it was a, you know, a um, compensation for what had happened, the fundamentals of the state were based around a, a racist principle of um, only uh, Jewish citizens. Um, and that's kind of grown and take on different, taken on different forms over the last 60 years. But fundamentally, if you're going to displace uh, an entire people and you're going to uh, mandate that only certain kinds of people can live there, then eventually you're going to end up with the kind of gross uh, monstrosity of uh, a nation that we have now. And the government is taking it that direction further and further. You're seeing the right wing tip Israel further and further into this kind of abyss of morality where anything goes. You can have judicial killings, uh, extrajudicial killings, um, all the kidnappings that go on, the massacres of civilians. And somehow, in the kind of moral logic of Israel, they think this is OK. And that just shows how perverted the psyche has become over these last 60 years. Dr. Nabil, as a Palestinian, seeing these people, Somali and Sudanese, fleeing from a war situation, I mean, how do you react to that, the reports that these people are being detained in a, in what is it, a camp in the desert in Israel? Well, the, the, the Israeli public opinion, there used to be some sort of a, of a public opinion. I mean, for, for example, I like to remind you of the massacre of Sabra and Shatila in 1982 that was actually... Uh, uh, conducted by the Israelis, uh, their planning, their supervision, and uh, their responsibility. And at the time, uh, 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 several hundred thousand Israelis went down the streets protesting Sabra and Shatila, which had led to a commission that, in effect, fired Eric Sharon, the Minister of Defense, from his position. But today, there is nothing of the sort even though the, the crimes are glaring uh, and the violations of human rights are, I, I don't see really <clears throat> much of an Israeli public opinion that would stand up to the government. Dr. Uh, Nabil, uh, thank you very much for joining us. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but that's all we have time for in tonight's program. Thanks to my guests and thanks to you for tuning in. Remember, you can join in our Twitter conversation all our, on all our tonight's stories by tweeting Islam Channel and using the hashtag The Report. We're back tomorrow night, but for now we'll leave you with this footage of thousands of mourners at a funeral earlier today for the two Palestinian men shot dead by the Israeli army. Good night.